So okay. I share my screen. Let me just uh, make me host. Uh, yep. There you go. Okay. Um, so uh, we are at chapter five. Uh, chapter five is about change. Um, so it is. Uh, it's a different topic altogether, and the style of presentation in uh, in the book uh, changes also because of uh, the change of topic. Um, it goes back to something similar to. Uh, Theory, not quite, something between, he says, something between theory, the formal theory of the subject and the greater logic. So it is more didactic, less deductive. Um, the style of presentation in um, um, the first, the, the book two to book four was more, it was very deductive. Um, what I did was, uh, not that I, I want to review this here, but it's up to you. I don't think that we need to review it. Uh, I created a summary, um, which uh, ended up being too too long in terms of number of pages, of book three, um, the local analysis, and then the global analysis uh, of, of book three. And then, uh, uh, the relation, this, uh, the, summary of propositions and then the 10 propositions uh, at the end. So uh, it's there if you guys want to take a look at it, but um, I don't think that we need to, we need to do that, right? I think we can go back to it if, if we need, but we can move, right. start from. Okay, so um, book five is about change. And uh, the first question that I think uh, that you put forward is, um, like how can we think about change? Um, now we have uh, such a um, complex and rich machinery, um, which we call uh, the greater logic, uh, the transcendental logic, or uh, what he earlier called uh, uh, phenomenology. Um, he quickly re uh, recalls and reminds us that uh, the question of change also was a great topic within uh, within being an event, and within being an event, this uh, question was addressed uh, not by ontology, um, and uh, there was a different theory, um, basically, um, other than ontology that addressed the question of change. Uh, he's saying that similarly in uh, uh, in logic. Uh, it is not the transcendental logic or the greater logic that addresses the question of change. Uh, not that question of change is uh, something that is totally um, um, strange to the transcendental logic. It is, uh, it is embedded within what uh, he calls later on modifications, but uh, what he, he's making a, an initial differentiation that what he calls is what he, call, what he means as the theory of change is a theory of true change, a change that is a complete abruption of the status quo and uh, is not a simple modification of appearance or intensity or what, um, uh, what a, a multiple has to go through in order to appear in a certain world. Um, so, um, in this sense, uh, he's saying that the, he already deducted or he already uh, deduced in being an event that the thought uh, of change in the, in the context of what he means uh, as change is really a singularity. Uh, it's singularity is, and uh, the question of singularity is not only important for us because of uh, phenomenological reason that Work changes, we need to understand the change. But he thinks that uh, any genuine thought uh, basically starts with singularity. Um, and uh, thinking in its pure form uh, never grapples with the status quo. Uh, it always um, uh, 
uh, has to do with a singular form, which is impossible to think according to the status quo. So for him, the question of singularity and question of change is really tied some in, uh, in a very uh, coherent way with the destiny of thinking altogether. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, to find, for example, the, the phenomenological change or, uh, or physical change or something like that. Um, and he thinks that um, the same way uh, singularity is the way that we uh, need to formulate or theorize the, the change um, and singularity is not the consequence of the laws of the world, uh, then change cannot be the result of the laws of the world or the laws of ontology for that matter. Uh, we have seen that you uh, express, has expressed this point about ontology in being an event, that, uh, that as a matter of fact, ontology itself forecloses the thinking of singularity through devising an axiom. Uh, this is the testament actually to the awareness that the mathematical thinking has uh, for the paradoxes of excess by inscription uh, of the thought of infinity in mathematical axioms. Um, uh, so uh, not only ontology is incapable of thinking change, it has made great efforts in order to foreclose this, this thinking within, uh, or thinking of singularity, I should say, within, uh, within ontology. Um, and it is able to produce the body of mathematical theory by being able to foreclose uh, this singularity. So, um, so the, the format of this presentation is that these are my notes on the left and these are the quotes, as you can imagine, from, mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that are relevant to each section. Uh, so this quote, uh, the quotes that I like, but uh, more or less the quotes uh, basically says the same thing, that uh, there have been axiomatic decisions within ontology to foreclose singularity. The same thing, um, the same basically orientation that prevails uh, ontology is in effect in transcendental logic. Um, transcendental logic is also about unalterable world of objects. Um, we know that actually the world itself is possible because of the alterations that are imputed on uh, multiplicities um, in order for being to be to become or to uh, appear as a being there there has to be modifications to the multiplicity but these modifications uh, does not uh, or do not impute genuine change uh, of uh, uh, on beings uh, or uh, or beings there if anything this modification these modifications uh, are in fealty to the beings there, whose appearance constitutes the world. Uh, we saw this fealty in the first and second postulate of materialism, uh, that um, basically all atoms are, uh, are real, basically the first postulate of materialism, that all atoms are real. Uh, that no matter what type of modification we are talking about, at the end of the day, the multiple is the same when it appears, um, uh, there, is no, there is no change to the actual constitution of the multiple. Um, a word has a logical identity in its transcendental indexing of an object as well as the deployment of its relation in the world. Um, this means that the logical modification of a word uh, situates or localizes the mul multiplicities that appear in that world the word is this modification. Uh, word is nothing but the modification of the multiples according to an inherent logic that we call the complete heighting algebra uh, imputed on the multiplicities through the transcendental indexing. It is important to note that a word inscribes uh, its own becoming. Um, so one, one thing that actually we discussed when we were discussing book three was uh, the question of time and uh, 
that you emphasize is that uh, the changes or the becoming of a world uh, in the uh, in the direction of time is what is already inscribed within each word. The becoming or the modification uh, through time to the objects themselves and the relations among them is also something that is expressible and expressed through the transcendental of the world. Um, the temporal changes to the objects and their uh, relations are modifications that mu multiplicities endure when they appear in the world. Uh, in that sense, a word is nothing but this modification necessary for the appearing of the multiplicities according to a certain transcendental. Uh, in that modifications, uh, multiplicities are the same, but they go through different uh, intensities and amplitudes that are regulated by the transcendental of the world. Uh, I like this uh, quote that he has on this side. Uh, we will call modifications the rule governed appearing of in, in intensive variations which a transcendental authorizes in the world of which it is the transcendental. Modification is not change or better, it is only the transcendental absorption of change. That part of becoming which is constitutive of every being there. Uh, one thing that I, that, uh, just two, two comments. Uh, one thing that I only realized now while I was talking to Caron before our meeting uh, in, the, in the other class is that uh, it's actually very, very, there's a nice way to talk about the difference between modification and what Badiou would call proper change uh, with regards to singularity, because uh, I think what he calls change, like uh, eventual change or however you want to call it, it's that change that you cannot ascribe to the laws of a world, right? So uh, you see some change and you say, why or where does this capacity come from or what is where does the potential for this come from and every change in a world for him you can ascribe this to the to the world so why is this thing becoming why is it changing why is this process happening if you can refer refer that change back to any sort of tendency rule pr uh, kind of process or something like this to a regularity, right? Uh, even if it is an unstable regularity, like some sort of chaotic system, it's still the laws of chaotic systems that describe that. If you can do that, so if the referent of the change is the world, this is not what he called change. Change Absolutely. is only the case in which you need to, you're obliged, like you're objectively obliged to describe the body uh, of the, the singular body of the transformation as the source of the change. So when you want to talk about social turmoil, you can talk about, for example, uh, the situation of racism in America, how all of this creates certain tendencies. But when proper change is happening, you're obliged to talk about something singular, like Black Lives Matter is doing something. Like so suddenly you, you need, like you're, objectively required to connect that capacity, that, that law to a singular region rather than to the world, right? Uh, I think that's like a really kind of nice way to connect singularity to change. Like mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes, you're only able to formulate a statement. And I mean, of course, if, you're, if you don't believe, or if you're not faithful, or if you don't, uh, uh, engage with a certain process you will say ah but it is just the the world that's that's what happens if you people are oppressed they will rebel and you know it's just social phenomena you will reduce it back to the world this is a manifestation of social turmoil if you're engaged you will have you have a different form of statement a different proposition where that transformation is a function of that singular process right so uh, it is, let's say, there is a, a war or a battle between the world and the singular situated multiple, right? Singularity is, let's say, that which requires you to, to uh, inquire 
about the capacity of something specific to affect something, rather than it being the effect itself of worldly causes, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a nice, uh, I think there is some nice intuition about the connection between change and singularity in this sense. Uh, some people say, for example, I mean, one, one place where I see this often in the clinic is that people are having a hard time in their relationship. For example, their sexual life is like cooling off. And then they say, but this is just the law of relationships. Like people after a couple of years, things cool off and something like this. This is a description where the thing you're going through is not singular. That cooling off doesn't refer back to you as a couple. It has nothing to do with what you're doing, what you could do. It has to do with the laws of the world. That's how it goes, right? In opposition to people who subjectivize that impasse and say, what is happening with us? We were different. What is different now? So they suddenly it becomes an investigation about something singular. I think that's a nice way to distinguish it. That's a very good example. Right. Um, I, uh, I also, you, you opened up and it's very, uh, and, he, and he mentions this, not that uh, I am prepared to discuss it uh, today, but I think um, his criticism of Deleuze is exactly the same thing. Uh, his criticism is that uh, no matter how chaotic the laws of the world uh, are, um, you cannot deduce or, uh, or uh, bootstrap uh, singularity from, these, from this chaotic uh, situation because at the end of the day, these are laws. Um, discontinuity cannot come uh, out of uh, continuity even though that continuity uh, is chaotic, something like that. Mm -hmm. he, he makes that criticism to uh, to Deleuze. And also, I mean, just two other comments on this point. One is that I really recommend, yesterday, uh, Dennis gave a presentation on this group on political economy we're doing uh, for the side project on Marx. He gave a presentation on a PhD thesis called Systems, Generativity, and Interactional Effects, which is a PhD thesis of a guy from MIT on how to formalize systems theory with category theory. And one of the gains of that formalization is that uh, I, I have a thesis and the video, I can send it to you guys. But uh, one of the gains of that process is that you distinguish nonlinearity from emergent properties. So he shows that emergent properties are possible even in linear systems, meaning you can have full determinism and still have this sort of emergent effects because it's actually a function of something else and category theory helps you to show that. And the funny thing that I, I felt was really good is that he uses most of the machinery of compositionality that we saw in the atomic logic. So uh, he shows that generative effects are, can be better thought as shift in a resolution, like the interaction between two systems seen at a resolution one, so covered in a certain way, if seen from a resolution two, will have properties that when seen from the first resolution, they didn't have. So for example, the most stupid example you can ever find, it, uh, it's, it, it's definitely not sophisticated, but I think it just gives you the right intuition, uh, even though it's very stupid, is the following. Like, for example, imagine I want to, like I have two units and I want to add another two units, right? Two plus two. And I have here one, two, three, four, and five. So the, the sum, so let's call this A and B, the sum of A plus B is distinct of the sum of A plus the sum of B. That's the basic, I mean, he will write this, the general formulation is, the mapping, a certain, he calls veiling, because it's a map that loses information. The veiling of A plus B is distinct from the veil of A plus the veil of B. That's, that's, I mean, we can go into it at some point, but that's how you get like the formalization of generative effects based on composition, because it's only the matter of how you, uh, how you compose things. So, Different laws of composition, so di different properties or predicates or phenomenal components, uh, 
they can give rise to effects that are larger than the causes. Mm -hmm. so the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, so, uh, sorry, Rez, just to go back to, to your slides, right? Is that uh, there is there a little quote that you added, which is one of the few explicit quotes in the book, where Badiou will talk about the relativity of scales. He says, we abide to the lessons of relativity of Galileo, Einstein, and Laurent Natal. Laurent Natal is a friend of Badiou, who is doing a very generous service of kind of raising the guy to the level of, uh, of Einstein and Galileo. Uh, but he proposes the relativity of scales, right? Mm -hmm. And he shows that this fractal geometry where the differentiation of a function doesn't converge. So if you adopt a resolution R, or for example, uh, the, the classic example is the, the one of measuring the coast of a country, right? So for example, you have here the, the, the coast, and if you adopt a resolution one, so the, your unit of like your measuring stick is one, the sum of this converges to some number 100. Now you choose another resolution like 0 0.5. And if you measure it, it converges to a different number, like 1,000. And the change in resolutions doesn't converge in the change of the measurement, right? So they don't converge. So Notal shows that this sort of relativity of scales is actually a property of physical systems. The, each, each physical system has a proper, it, like it gives you the proper resolution for its consistency. That's not an external thing about the observer, right? So I, I, I think it's very nice to see that there is some formal theory today for becoming, for let's say treating becoming as something real like it's not just an illusion right something is added to things through their composition so a, pro a theory of emergent properties a theory of surprising effects that is absolutely contained in Badiou's theory of objects right it's not it doesn't require an additional thing it doesn't require some secret ingredient or let's say some qualitatively distinct systems like dynamic systems chaotic. So uh, I thought that that was very kind of enlightening to how how far the theory of the world go, right? The thing he says here about modifications being rule-governed appearing of intensive variation, you can take it very far and not simply imagine ah, everything that is modified without, keep, without changing the form, right? No, you can actually have compositional effects that really transform an object and they still are rule governed and they're still covered by the, the logic of the object, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Very good. Hi, Dennis. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, so... I'm muted. No yeah, problem. I was caught up at work. Um, did okay. you already make it through halfway of the presentation? No, no, we started from slide 11. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, actually, we started from slide 12. You're one slide off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the first uh, few slides are the summary of uh, book three and four. Ah, okay, great. Um, so, uh, continuing with the, uh, the question of change, uh, this differentiation then between modification and change uh, that use proceeds to uh, assert that uh, then, so we, we said ontology in being an event, we discussed through uh, the axiom of foundation actually forecloses the question of a singularity uh, and transcendental logic through the postulate of materialism forecloses uh, or follows the suit. So it actually is sutured to the same foreclosure um, of uh, uh, of banishing or or uh, um, or stopping or foreclosing the singularity, um, uh, but you assert that neither ontology as the thing of, of being nor logic as the thing of appearing captures change as what affects the constitution of being or the constitution of being there. 
Um, so what does? Um, so that's the question uh, basically this chapter is about. So now we have established that neither ontology nor logic um, basically deals with the question of change. Uh, what uh, deals with the question of change? And uh, the answer, the general answer is, the vicissitude of the answer is that if there is anything, it must be the exception to the law and the axioms grounding the laws, both in ontology and in the logic. So that was um, the, the basic uh, um, uh, uh, landscape of, mm -hmm. of this chapter. Uh, now he starts with the uh, topic of subversion of appearing by being, and uh, he defines the concept of the site um, as, uh, as the site of change, as a matter of fact. But you say, if the category of change is thinkable, which is nevertheless unthinkable either to ontology or uh, to uh, logic, its place of thinking is in the rift between ontology and logic, between being and being there. How is this? As Wittgenstein has said, the world is all that is the case. Or as Badiou, Badiou says, there is only being there of multiplicities. So if there is a place for thinking, the change is in the rift of being and being there. The way that uh, Badiou formulates this rift is when a multiple appears, it is objectivated. We, we talked about this a little bit before. In the world by, by the transcendental indexing of its elements uh, that come to objectivate itself by figuring among its own elements and by thus being caught up in the transcendental indexing of which it is the ontological support. So uh, the way that I understand this point is that the multiple itself uh, basically becomes the transcendental or the logic of appearing of its own atoms as opposed to the transcendental of the world, it becomes the uh, transcendental of its own atomic logic, or it provides, or what the, the word he uses, it, the appearing invokes uh, the multiple itself uh, in order to uh, basically um, go through the process of appearing. It is the rift between being objectivated, which is the normal modification in the world, and being objectivating, which means that you are not only appearing, but appearing according to a transcendental that has a, is different from the transcendental of the world. This paradoxical being, which is able to, at, while at the same time is objectivated, to be objectivating, but you cause a sight. Um, let me. Wordly, uh, this is the this is the quote that I thought is important. Yeah, it's the best quote, yeah. Wordly objectivation turns this multiple into a synthesis between the objectivating, the multiple support and reference of a phenomenality, and the objectivated belonging to the phenomena, we call such a paradoxical being a site. The, the way that I think about this is, I mean, I think that the, the, the artistic examples are good here because uh, in a certain sense, they deal very clearly with, with the objective aspect because uh, the way that I understand this is, for example, uh, I think the metaphor of form and matter, that, that, that grammar is a good one, right? So for example, you have a form that directs how to treat a certain material. And suddenly, for example, you, you come to a situation where the material itself has some particularity to it, that it, it itself gives form to something you wouldn't, right? So the form comes from the material and not from you. A good example that I, I, I find here is a recent, not so recent, but kind of recent mu movement in experimental music called spectralism. And 
I find this interesting because spectralism, uh, Caron can correct me here in my, uh, in my ignorance, but from what I understand, it's a movement that started with a sort of idea that if you probe into the actual, like, scientific specter of frequencies of each individual instrument and sound, you actually get a lot of irregularities that are quite singular to that instrument or to that particular uh, uh, this, uh, apparatus. And you, you can actually extract musical ideas from, like you can try to negotiate with those singularities. So rather than have a music and then you have instruments to play it, you can actually analyze, for example, how that particular violin or that particular flutes uh, how the overtones appear when it plays a certain note, right? And you can then consider that slightly irregular kind of overtone series for the flute as part of the music you're going to compose. It's going to actually beget the form of the musical idea rather than be submitted to it, right? So in yeah, a certain no, sense... The, the, the classic book about uh, spectral composition is called Timbre, a metaphor for la composition. Timbre, a metaphor for composition. Which is exactly that. Like, uh, you analyze timbre, timbre, which is the internal composition of any sound through a spectrogram. You, you pull a spectrogram out of the sound, and the spectrogram has uh, uh, all the, the relevant information, a certain reading of the relevant information represented there, and also what is quite important, uh, a dynamic unfolding of the sound. It's not just a vertical, a vertical representation of the harmonics or anything like that, but the different times where the harmonic appear in a sound. And this, uh, the composition then becomes kind of a change of scale. You're like uh, using this, this model to shape a musical form. Instead of just being a sound, the, the, the model of a sound, a singular sound, this singular sound becomes the model of the composition. So timbre, timbre metaphor for the composition. So this yeah, is, I find that a approach. perfect title. It is, it, is quite, it is quite correct. It's the idea is like, you have that which was previously just the matter. Like an like, informed matter, right? Yeah, yeah, like preformed matter, yes. Like in traditional composition, you have, you know, fixed forms, like in poetry, you know, uh, traditional forms, traditional things you can do. And you have the uh, instruments that are doing what is given, like the, the timbers are given in a sense, right? So uh, in spectralism, you, you, you are analyzing the timber to be to, in order for this material, this, that which was like the black box, the material black box of music to become form in a sense. Yeah, I like this idea because the way that I think about this is like this. When the multiple becomes an object, uh, logically, sure, you treat it in terms of localization and so on and so forth. But in a certain other term, you can imagine that an object is actually, let's say, a division between form and matter. Right? It's a division between what has in relevant information and what, which then connects it to other things in the world, and what is, let's say, be, uh, let's say, noise about the about that object, right? It's either too small or too big or too lacking form, lacking something. It just, let's say, this it's a positional issue, right? It's not a substantial difference. It's just for a, a, a multiple in a world. Some of it has form, and some of it is below the form. It's the negation of the form. It's, it's uh, contingently in form, right? It's objectivated. Now, aside from, as I understand it, it's when something of the matter of the object, it's not determined, like this division is not determined by the transcendental, but it, it is allowed to participate in the problem of what the form will be, right? So for example, you can get this, so the matter, is the one that will, let's say, something of the matter will inform the object rather than simply the matter is formed by the object, right? By the objective logic. That's how I understand the objectivating, yeah, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The matter is objectivating. It, 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 you explore 
you define another the way that Badu used to talk about this when he was younger uh, is that you can talk about the laws and the non laws, right? In theory of the subject. And his point was all about well, structurally, there is a limit here. And the anxiety makes it so, like the anxious wandering in a world makes it so that every time something that is non law, that is informed, that is noise, appears, you put the law on it, right? And what he called historical dialectics was about how non-law can become law. So something that appears like noise, you go into it, you understand its own internal reasoning, right? And it begets a new form of objectivity, right? Yeah, like I, I remember like this chapter in uh, theory of the subject that goes like that, like uh, he uh, actually goes on uh, classifying different, sorry, different uh, philosophical positions like uh, absolute idealism, subjective idealism, uh, uh, like uh, pure, pure materialism, like La Maitrie, this kind of thing. And this is what, we, what you're saying, like there's this kind of spiral that is, that is uh, characteristic of his position at the time which I kind of assimilate to a kind of a transcendental realism, that is the fact that something that appears as noise ought to be reintegrated in the ideal sphere, so to speak, to use the terms he's, he's using yeah. at the time. Like he's talking about the difference between idealism and materialism or idealism and realism, right? So something appears that, that, is, not, uh, that is noise by the idealist standard of, the, of, a, certain, of a, a certain time slice, right? So you ought to integrate it somehow. So this, this which was noise will be like a new form that will be now the criteria by which you are reading the world and then a new noise appears to be integrated and then you, then you go. So this is like a, something that he's um, insisting a lot upon in that book, which is distortion. Like there's a torsion, transcendental torsion in a sense, which, uh, this noise, the appearance of noise, will will uh, 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 oblige you to to make distortion. Like yeah, so this, this is actually what he calls the uh, the. Actually, it is the MD, the the not the democratic material, the, the, the material Materialism. dialectic. Yeah, yeah, he's he's calling that that already by that time. What I like about it also is that it's. It's not to say that something that wasn't there is now there. Because it was there, it was just below, let's say, the bar of forms, right? It was counted as non law. Uh, it was it, counted it as counted matter. As one, so to speak. Yeah, it wasn't it, counted as one. Yeah, it was, let's say, below. It, it is in, in being an event what he calls uh, at the, a multiple at the edge of the void, right? Below yeah, yeah. The, that set, the idea is that there is nothing that you can count singularly like it's it's only counted as that set you cannot go below it right yeah uh, yeah of course yeah so it's like like that sort of structure and then the idea is that a um, site is when something of this has a power to objectivate rather than simply be objectivated right which which doesn't say much because for example you can even have a sort of almost delirious experience uh that you know like when you're in certain situations, phenomenologically, you might look like a, at a glass of water and suddenly you see that glass and you don't see a glass, right? Yeah, like yeah, that, the singularity of the glass emerges, but it doesn't mean you can do anything with it, right? Or yeah. the particularities of a certain something that has a form yeah, counts. Yeah, you know, you know, in, yeah. And in the, in the historical dialectics of art is a, is a great example, in fact, because in the historical dialectics of art, we are always, all the time, and several changes can be, can be intelligible by understanding that it is something of the material itself that is now, that wasn't really considered as part of, you know, the, the procedure, and now is being considered as part of the procedure. Of course, this way of putting it kind of, uh, makes the balance shift toward the subject, like we decided to consider it, consider it, but it's not really like that. The fact is 
that the material is inscribed. The thing is inscribed in the material you are working with. This is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Like, for instance, when, when we do like abstract painting, when we, do, when, it, when we did, for instance, noise music, because noise was this unwanted sound and now, okay, uh, there is noise there. So we, are, we ought to consider it now. So it kind of gives itself to consideration in a sense. Yeah, and, and I it think gives that's... Itself, it's objectivizing itself in a certain world in a sense, right? Yeah, and I think like that, that. The, the, the point is that uh, it's, it's sure there is something of the subject without which this is not possible, a sort of like this kind of is mediated by a hypothesis, right? There is an idea. But if you then say, yeah, this is all in your head, you also miss the mark because you're submitting to the rules of that matter. So the rules don't come from your head. You cannot do anything with the color that previously was hidden be behind the figure. When you suddenly say, okay, colors are forming. They're not just formed. They're objectivating in a painting space and not simply objectivated. You're not allowed to do anything. Like there's two things you can do and things, things that you cannot do, right? So you're still submitting to a form you're still submitted to a ruled process that is not coming from your head, but the statement, there is an idea in the matter, that statement would never have come from the world. So it's weird because the subject is a mediating for extracting something more real from matter than the previous form did, right? Like the idea binds you to the subject, but the rules, of this new procedure, <laughs> this investigation comes from the matter itself. You cannot do yeah. whatever you want with it. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, this is very interesting. Um, and an interesting. idea. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, just wanted to maybe make a connection with uh, this other thing that Gabriel and I have been discussing uh, regarding uh, interaction as as a way of producing more information than you started with. So uh, something like if maybe we could take form to be something that does something with matter, right? Like it coordinates it or it um, arranges it in a certain way. And let's say that maybe matter can be in a certain sense combined with itself, right? Th things that are matter can be joined together uh, in a certain way. And what we call the, the site or this kind of excess is like a, an inequality, right? Um, between the individual, individually formed pieces of matter and the, their conjoined form. You know, like just before you arrived, I was, I think, I think we weren't here yet. Like I was talking about yesterday's meeting and uh, I have the impression that this is actually, let's say the, the formula for what, but you would call just becoming because the shift from this to this doesn't require anything new, it just requires you, let's say, uh, as we were talking about shifting the scale of the composition, right, of the compositional form. Like you don't need to, I think what he, what, like we should distinguish this from like this singular change or eventual change because uh, what this formula shows is actually that, uh, and, and I think Adam's theory tries to show this, is that this is actually absolutely contained in the world, right? This inequality is actually expressible as an additional object, right? Uh, whereas the change that a site allows for is I think a bit stronger than this. It's not simply the excess of composition over the things being composed, uh, but actually a change in what counts as form and what counts as matter, right? Okay, so it's a change of the terms of F and M. Yeah, I think, I think it's something that makes the stability between this difference change. Mm, so I for example, you can have, for example, figurative painting organizing the mass of colors. And you can have a situation where the composition of figures uh, gives you more than the separate figures, for example. But you're always dealing with figures and the mass of colors. The issue is, how can it be the case that the very meaning of 
forms, right? The very space of all possible forms is transformed and the space of what counted as matter is transformed. Like, so I, 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 I find this very useful to, oh shit, I don't use your part. Uh, I find that the, the thing that Adam did very useful, more in the sense of proving that but what but you calls immobile world uh, actually includes all possible transformations based on compositionality like that's all covered in the logic of the object right so it may uh it leaves space open to a different sort of change like that would never arise merely by recomposition um, yeah so i mean i guess it really depends on whether you say that this this excess this surplus here can be grounded again in some other piece of matter yeah i think um, so yeah. yeah i mean i perhaps we could like to use adam's notation we to say if the third object that you add here because uh, this guy shows that you can turn this inequality into a third term here that hand renders this equal again uh if this third term requires you to add something that doesn't exist in the world then it's true change. If it can be added here, something that already exists, then it's regular modification. Yeah, something like that. Right? Yeah. Something like that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, what is interesting uh, to me, I mean, this um, discussion of uh, matter and form, I think is much more didactic than the way that, uh, but you explains it to, uh, through, uh, Again, he, the, the style that he has or the, the choice of theorizing that he has, which is uh, um, self-inclusion, mm -hmm. right? I agree. Because um, self-inclusion is still very obscure in terms of uh, what really the relation of self-inclusion uh, is with the subject of change, right? Yeah, because Se this multiple actually looks like form and matter. Yeah, like self-inclusion is kind of declaring, it's kind of analogous of, of declaring something in the situation to be kind of relevant, right? Something like that. So self-inclusion, you're counting something that was already in the situation, you're counting it again and representing it, right? So uh, it makes sense, like, but it has to be mediated through some examples, right? In order to, to make sense in in the in the sense that we are intending this discussion, I think. Yeah. But I think uh, the discussion of form and matter actually is really even helping the the question of self inclusion because for something from being merely objectivated to being objectivating means that there is something of that thing itself is going to be included in that thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the. Uh, like the the verbiage that uh, that you uses is that the uh, the process of appearing is invoking the multiple itself. What is this multiple? Is the matter? Uh, yeah. Because um, uh, this is this is what is being, and then the matter uh, is uh, is becoming something like a uh, authority for its own appearing. Yeah. I think that's the materialist way, right, to, to talk about this. Like, it's matter that begets the idea. Right. Or begets the form in this case. Begets the form, yeah. We should yeah, definitely, that is... we should de definitely do a, a comparison to theory of subject because I think this is all there, but yeah. Yeah, it's much, I think that, that, this, that terminology is closer to what he's saying. In, and also in, in, in theory of the subject, the way that he talks about this that I find very... Uh, nice is comparing algebra and topology in the sense of a point and pointless spaces, right? So yeah. rather than having like this top and bottom, like form and matter, he talks about, let's say, form as being this kind of region that now counts as one, but it's actually filled with stuff. Like, why can't you distinguish this, this right, left side of it from the right side, right? So like this mm -hmm. from this. So he says, when you're looking at it algebraically, you're just seeing the point as the operator or the place. But when you're looking at it topologically, you're seeing a space, like a vicinity, a neighborhood, 
right? Mm -hmm. So you can actually imagine this being distinguished into two parts, like this and this, like which is actually changing the covering, right? Mm -hmm. A different cover will actually, let's say, allow you to make into two what was previously one. So I think that at that time it was a bit metaphorical because uh, it's not true that the move from algebra to topology is, is like from uh, a move from stability and uh, law to a space of creativity and novelty. But it's a nice metaphor of thinking about space as a place and thinking about space as a covering right, that you could change if you find the right terms, if you have the right predicates, if you have the right hypothesis, and you can extract from, from, a, a, from a region, right, uh, a internal law of its differentiation. And you might use this internal law to reorganize things in the situation, right? Uh, but what I think that he does in, in our whole discussion on scales is good to have in mind is that scaling is not the path for novelty, right? Scaling is a different, let's say, regime of differentiation like time and space. Uh, you can go into and out of things and they are still in the world. But it, it kind of helps anyway to think about this sort of extraction from matter, extraction of a form out of matter, right? Uh, and uh, and I find it very profound, in fact, that he, I mean, there is a Deleuzean theory of this with that guy, uh, Simon Don, of how form and matter are actually kind of intrinsically connected. There is no such thing as a matter that is formed from the outside. And in Badiou, it's the same thing. Uh, form and matter is a division, as an intra-worldly division, right? In the world, as the, our classic example, in the world of household pets, a cat is a form and the cells of a cat are the matter, right? But in the world of a, of a veterinarian, cells are actually the form and the internal atomic composition of the cells are the matter. So we're object, uh, objective logic is always a way of slicing, right? The count as one in phenomenology is the count of what counts as form and what counts as matter. And it's already this. Uh, this makes uh, the whole the importance of the theory of event to be subsumed by the theory of generic, mm -hmm. because um, it is the essence of the generic that matter actually uh, is can be formalized in a way that the the formalization that is established cannot recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, through uh, through the generic subset and through the method of forcing. So uh, method of forcing is the materialist theory to show how in a denumerable set, uh, a denumerable uh, infinitely, uh, denumerable infinite uh, subset of, uh, uh, of a set can be um, can can create a new subset which is which cannot be named which is a form of the existing um, of the existing naming system within yeah uh, and so, i also think rather that this clarifies something from uh, another aspect which is we cannot define materialistically what is an axiom right because in it's only in ontology, it's only in set theoretical ontology that the edge of the void is actually the void. So you have sets and you have this void, like sets that have nothing inside. And axioms actually come from here. Yeah. They come from nothing because ontology is made of nothing. But in any sure. other situation, they come from material. So like, if you want to move from uh, ontology to other situation, it's the move from extracting axioms from nothing and extracting hypotheses from material. Like in actual situations, you don't take hypotheses from nowhere. Like, but he was not an idealist. Like he wouldn't say, "Oh, politically, you come up with something in your head." Like, what if we all gave hands? In actual, in actual procedures. 
exactly. tools, procedures that come from the matter. Exactly. So that's how you move. Like, that's why ontology can be axiomatic. Being axiomatic in ontology is materialist because right. extra it's doing the same as you're doing the, in the rest of the procedure, right. which is extracting hypotheses from the form of the matter. But Which, uh, too bad you, that, that empty is actually the actual matter for ontology, which exactly. is the inconsistent. So it, we call it void in, in ontology, but really that is the matter for ontology. Yeah, so inconsistency, in, because it says the void is the name of the inconsistent multiple. Right. So axioms come from the inconsistency, because that's the exactly. matter of ontology. Whereas that in is, other situations, the inconsistent matter is actual material right and that's right. the so, job of the axiom in order to make inconsistency thinkable exactly so there is actually a clear continuity between how axioms operate in ontology and how hypotheses operate in concrete situations because both of them are extracting form out of an inconsistent matter that is just objectivated but not objectivating in that world but of course they change their face, like their, their character completely, because in ontology that matter is just in, inconsistent multiplicity. Uh, and in actual situations, it's the proper matter of that situation. It's not some kind of metaphysical underground, right? But you, that's how you get, let's say, the feel for his materialism. And uh, that is why it is important, like JP said, and what I discuss in this, in this manuscript is um, that um, all this is already embedded in theory of the subject. Um, like the theory of the subject is uh, the, the asymptote, that asymptotic thinking that he's, ta he's talking about. Exactly. The asymptote is always the, the approach that the thinking, or in this case, formal thinking uh, in, in his language back then, uh, formal thinking always reaches the act, the being, which is the matter, but never exhausted. And it's always, there is a remainder that that remainder is always begetting new forms. Okay, uh, good discussion. Actually, we should add this discussion somewhere uh, here. Uh, I'll probably write something. Um, so, uh, so he, he, he now goes back to being an event. Uh, there, is, there is a difference. Um, so logic of the words completely is built completely on being an event um, and hence being an event volume two, uh, but there are some differences. Uh, one of the big differences that uh, he has is in this uh, theory of the site, and uh, he uh, basically names four people who actually brought, uh, 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 brought this point up, um, brought this to Bellew's uh, attention, De Santé, Deleuze, Nancy, and Lyotard, uh, was, uh, when did Deleuze pass away? So he actually something. read, uh, oh, he sorry, comments he actually, on being an event. Yeah, he commented on 95 it, some, I think I think yeah. it was 95 was, yeah in uh, what time. is philosophy there is a like two page long footnote on being an event yeah, right? yeah. what is philosophy oh, okay. is quite interesting because it has like two pages on but and has like a footnote on La Ruelle so all these names that were you know getting big in also in the anglophone world I haven't the 90s, read those uh, were, were being commented upon by by Deleuze and Guattari in, in what is philosophy I will take it. I will definitely take a look at uh, at those footnotes. I think I have what is philosophy. What can you give me a glimpse of it uh, right now? Yeah, they, they they approve of his ontology of the multiple. They say this is the path to go, the multiplicity. But then they make their classic claim, which I find, uh, but you criticize it later on. That they they say, oh, but but you is so committed to set theory that he cannot think then. Uh, intentional differentiation, only extensional differentiation, mm -hmm. uh, and infinity is intensive and not only extensive. And so his concept of multiple is like one concept. So it's still tied to the one because it's the concept of the multiple. 
and but you basically wrote yeah. a letter to the little thing you don't know mathematics but uh <laughs> it's, 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 it's quite interesting because because like uh for a for a i mean for a, somebody that is a very good reader of both they are kind of talking past each other in a sense because they they say that about Badiou in what is philosophy and then Badiou wrote, writes a whole book to say that Deleuze is a, a philosopher of the one yeah because of that because of intensive differences and all of that because uh the multiples are not unbinded for Deleuze they are binded in a sense yeah i think actually like, that's actually a really profound discussion that we didn't really go into uh, when I was talking about the object and the postulate of materialism, because Badiou says, my postulate of materialism is here to prevent virtuality, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I mean, one thing that I'm always kind of struck about Deleuze's use of mathematics, because sure, it kind of plays nicely with the whole minor uh, philosophy of minor literature becomomings, minor, minor becomings, yeah. molecular but differential like differential calculus is such a i mean really that's your model for infinity like the loses two models for yeah. infinity are uh, differential calculus which i mean yeah, it's, it's begins with the problem of the yeah. one right the, the problem of calculus is not infinity it's the limit right mm -hmm. yeah uh, and and the whole discussion of Emile Berrier on the incorporeal. More infinitesimal than transfinite. Yeah, and it's not even infinitesimal like as an object of thought, because... No, uh, it is, yes, it is the, the question of limit. It, because, I mean, he didn't really get interested in uh, Robinson's axiomatization, like non-standard arithmetics or non-standard analysis, which was an axiomatic system that gave, let's say, credibility to infinitesimals as real, right? Mm. Deleuze was interested in the in, in the infinite only in so far as it remained, let's say, the the virtual supplement of the real, never the real thing. So, for example, you get him quoting this classic Stoic uh, example that, for example, sections of a cone, right? They will have a certain yeah. circum circumference, uh, mm -hmm. but if you get, let's say, circumference A and you get the one very close to it, like from a, you have a distance here, right? You choose a random distance and you get a different circumference here, a line. Like this will always fit inside of this, right? Because this is always smaller. So if you take sections of a cone like this, you can never really con reconstruct their continuity. Uh, so he says the form of the cone is virtual because it cannot be reconstructed back from the actual sections of a cone, which is like a proto-calculus argument about differentiation and in, in integrals, right? But the proto-zeno argument too. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because that argument really ties together creativity, virtuality, infinity, form, right? And the idea of life as this sort of virtual potency of possible forms, right? As always being there but never being material right you can never talk about uh extracting it from matter because matter is infinite variation and form is let's say the virtual supplement on top of it right so i mean the, the way i understand this is like the example that i wanted that i tried to use last time is like as if the multiple is an infinite grid uh grading of colors and you add like there is a virtual kind of black dot, but here you have like all sorts of gray and white and other colors perhaps, right? And then you get, let's say, the appearance of black. And Badiou says, if you have a black dot, it must be real in the multiple, right? You might like select one black dot to be the atom and the, the gray is the variation around it, but you don't get to objectify something which is not in the multiple because you simply extracted it from the average or from the integral of of that variation, right? Yeah, there are some kind of metaphysical presuppositions in the Lesion thought that molar objects that are, so to speak, counted as one 
are have kind of a, an infra level wherein you know uh, there are tendencies. They are kind of concretions of tendencies, something like that. So it, yeah. like the continuity, continuity of the cone is virtual because of that. The tendencies are the virtual and the concretions are the actual. But the concretions, both the actual and the virtual are real. So you, you have to need, you, you have to have the, both, the, the, both the, actual, the actual and the virtual to have reality in this sense. And, and a I think that object, a completed object is this, the matter and the tendencies that are, you know, responsible for the concretion of the object itself. So something so, like that. Yeah, I think that if we were to engage on a critique of Deleuze from Badiou's standpoint and things like this, since I mean Badiou does try to come closer to, to Deleuze in this book, like in debate at his field, right? You want a theory of intensity, here it is, a theory of becoming, here it is, of all of this, right? And I think that it would play into that point, right? What are the ontological commitments of only accepting the virtuality of infinity? Like, infinity can only be thought as virtual because the infinite multiple, like, he, he, because what Badiou would do, for example, with the cone example, is say, ah, but just axiomatize infinity for Christ's sake. You can have the set of all sections of a cone. That's not a problem. Right? You just cannot derive it, of course, from the finite set sections of a cone. You cannot derive it. You cannot reach it from below. That's yeah. the, that's a, yeah, the whole yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, because Deleuze is also, I think it's not just an ontological presupposition, but there are phenomenological presuppositions which are very heavy in Deleuzeanism. The idea of transcendental empiricism, for instance, is an empiricist, which is, which is not the same as a materialist. So to be an empiricist, you'll have to have like a correlate, a sensible correlate of everything you come up with. So this Wait is why, point. you know, mm -hmm. infinity is in, infinitesimal because infinitesimal uh, helps you get closer to an object and to the internal tendencies that give a concretion, give the object a concretion because it helps to think a certain uh, uh, sensible configuration. It's not mm -hmm. a rational configura configuration, it's a sensible configuration. The way that I understand it is uh, Deleuze is a philosopher of continuity, and that's why he cannot, he can never think infinity as an actuality. Because the only way to think infinity as an actuality is through an axiom, uh, through an axiom. Uh, so for him, there is no above and below. Whereas for Badiou, there is for Badiou and, and ZFC, there is an ax, uh, there is an absolute disruption, which is the disruption of, you can never uh, reach from below, you can never reach infinity. And this disruption, which is important, uh, this is how you think. And that is exactly what we are talking about, that um, the possibility of thinking impossibility is through uh, bringing some, something from, uh, uh, in an axiomatic way in order to think that. Whereas for, uh, for Deleuze, it has to be a continuous process. And it's funny because it's even materialistic in the sense that we're talking about. So for example, you have here uh, N and the successor of N, right? And you kind of get the feeling that there is something which is the ground for this, right? The ground for finite operations is indefinite. Exactly. And then you add as an axiom the indefinite number. It, you allow it to give matter, like to give form to a new operation, right? Because the operations on this will be different than the operations on this. For example, if I have an n number and I add one to it, it's a different number. But if I add one to an infinite number, it's the, it's the same. Actually, it is very, uh, very funny. I mean, uh, very profound what, what you're saying, because these are the two points about infinity that Badiou mentions about Spinoza and about Hegel. And that is these two great geniuses actually prior to formalization of axioms found exactly the two properties of the axiom. One is that infinity is in absolute disruption with finite. Hence what Spinoza is saying about uh, infinite, uh, infinite uh, what they call it, uh, modality, finite and infinite modality, that 
one cannot beget the other one. And number two is, although Hegel is trying to show or deduce infinite from finite, he's exactly talking about infinite as the ground for this successive operations. Yeah. So these, these are the two conditions for uh, axiom of infinity that uh, is, is actually is combined within the axiom of infinity, both of them. Yeah, so if you want to not have to choose between Hegel and Spinoza, just get Badiou where you get both. <laughs> or you get Cantor. Yeah, you get Cantor. You don't even get Badiou yet. But, <laughs> yeah, but I think that's important. I mean, just to... But the to thing is, Badiou has turned our attention to the importance of Cantor as, as the suture between Hegel and Spinoza. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, but just not, not to lose track here, I think that uh, I know Desanti... Uh, has that point about, you know, category theory could give a different uh, view of ontology. But, I, but in his text on the intrinsic ontology, he also mentions the paradox of being an event. Because being an event, you have two processes, right? You have the site at, you, at the edge of the void. Then uh, you get a name for this. So somebody needs to declare that this is the case, right? And then you get, uh, sorry, you actually have three, three processes. You have the site at the edge of the void. You have the event of this appearing. Then somebody needs to name that this appeared, right? This needs to become the object of a naming. And then you get fidelity. But you, I, I think that we should be a bit generous with him because there is a very profound, and I find it actually one of the best things about being an event, uh, which is that he, he wants to make sure that you don't suppose that the event tells you what it means to be faithful. Like, nothing tells you how to... Like, novelty is also the novelty of what it means to say something is new. Right? It's not simply novelty doesn't impose itself on you. So he wanted a mediation between the event and fidelity. So you wouldn't assume that events happened and they cause you to be faithful. So he adds this thing here. But then people said, uh, look, but you, you redouble the event. Because why is the naming not a second event? Right? You need, you, something appears from the void something emerges from the void, you then recognize that it happened. And this is novelty one, and this is novelty two. So uh, Desanti points this out. Uh, Lyotard uh, says that Badiou's theory is a theory of sovereignty. He says, well, if fidelity is always fidelity to the naming. So it is like a sovereignty, right? Somebody needs to be this, something is a sovereign. Somebody is able to pronounce the existence of something. And uh, I, I, I think that he should have included here uh, Luca Frazier as well, because in her really amazing dissertation on Sartre and Badiou, she also points this out, that there is a weird kind of self, the, the problem of self-belonging and naming of what's taking place is a kind of a Sartrean problem of decision and so on. Uh, so uh, everyone focuses on this distinction, right? on the move of the matter into the world and then the forming of the matter into the world, right? So it, this was separate. And I think this is what he no longer needs because to emerge in a world is, you don't need a name, right? You already, the world gives you a, like, the form comes from here. You don't need it to come from the name. So I think that's a bit what, what happens, you know? Yeah, but I still, I say that, I still find the discourse of naming uh, very illuminative. Well, I, I say that uh, a little bit later, why? But it's a good point. Uh, don't forget it. Um, so, um, so he says that um, they, they pointed out, like uh, you said, Gabriel, and we discussed earlier, 
that there, there is like a double movement from below and from above. So you have the materialist condition, which is the, in the language that we developed here, the form and matter. There is a materialist condition, which is the actual site of the void, um, uh, which is the below, and also the, uh, the movement from above, that uh, is the naming. Uh, so there, is, there seems to be a chasm and a kind of competition, a uh, kind of uh, tension between these, this movement from below and above. And uh, he's uh, a little bit lamenting about this double approach which at the end is clearly needed. Well, he says that this double approach is needed, but uh, now we are clearly seeing that this double approach is actually the emergence of the form from, uh, from a matter, uh, a temporary emergence or, um, uh, well, uh, an emergence of the form from the matter, a form that, is clearly different and distinguished from uh, from the form that uh, the world has, but uh, not in the in the uh, not in the, the language that being an event used. Um, I also think that what changes that Reza is that, as we discussed lengthy lengthy through this this presentation, is that logics of roles is also a theory of predication, right? A theory of what let's say of the infinite class of predicates that obtain in a world. Infinite, but not total. Like some do and some don't. So uh, you, you no longer need to think of this naming as coming, though it comes from somewhere, it doesn't need to come from, from nowhere, like an event, because it won't be able to be any name, right? So the, the, the matter that has become objectivating constraints the names that you can give it, right? For example, uh, in the case of the spectral uh, movement we were talking about, sure, they, they need to do something and they need to say the, the timbre of instruments has a form, right? But they still have to call it timbre and they still need to do some analysis rather than others and they still need to, uh, let's say, submit their predication of this spectral analysis, like if, they, if something is interesting or something is not interesting, to the actual uh, constraints of, of that matter, right? So part of the problem of naming is kind of absorbed by the worldly appearance of the site. It's no longer so loose as to say, okay, exactly. something something emerged without name. I can give exactly. it any name. So it's free and it's decision, it's eventful. Correct. No, it becomes... So, uh, in another way, so in another way of saying this is that, yes, there is a dual approach, but it is not like the second bullet uh, that you mentioned, or I mentioned here, is that this dual approach is not uh, coming from a historicity. It's coming from the matter itself. So the dialectic between, uh, between structure and historicity will, will be gone, and you are only me require the actual machinery of the of the multiple and the logic of appearing itself yeah. which makes um, which is uh, is in fealty with the objective phenomenology that uh, none of this is requires a figure of the subject uh, so to speak yeah. and the requirement of historicity and so on and so forth yeah because i mean you could have for example you could perfectly imagine a guy who who fixes instruments, getting this oboe to play and doing the spectral analysis and saying there is logic to the overtone and dynamic development of timbre. Like that's already the declaration. Like that's a, a predication that is giving form to what was formless. But okay, what about that? Right? So you've solved that's a, that's the eventual naming already. And not, that can happen all the time. It's not special. That's not the singular, right? So uh, it's not like the, oh my God, you named it. Now it's irreversible. It's, it's, you called it a revolution. Now it's impossible to go back. The naming split the world into two, right? No, the naming becomes more banal in that sense. It's, 
because it has to negotiate with the matter. The point is that once that exists, once that has been done, some things are possible. And the question is about what it means to follow that possibility, right? Yeah, it seems to me that the, the naming is very similar to just producing a new atom, right? Yeah. In the sense that like what you were saying earlier about the color field and then you have like one black element. So like uh, black element, uh, this is not the color black, but black element leads to blackness. As a as a predicate, right? Mm -hmm. This is the the singleton, and then this this is the predicate. Now you you're saying like with the spectral sequence, you have something like a spectral analysis. You're able to kind of invent uh, something that doesn't have a name yet, right? But it has some ontological content. <laughs> then the question is, what is the new name for this, right? Yeah. And the, the, I think the question there is following, for example, that, that's, for example, that gradient between black and gray, it was, when I looked at the black, I was already seeing it. It was there. Yeah. Right. I mean, one guy that I, I find perfect for this uh, is that um, one of my favorite painters, David Hockney. Have you seen any of his paintings? Like, uh, for example, he paints a lot, he, at some point in his career, he went into paint late landscapes in England and he paints them like a, a lot of pink and some strange coloring. And his point was, I'm not interpreting the landscape. The color is not in my head. There is pink in the, in a, in a, uh, plant, but you're just used to localizing the pink on the green. So the, the pink is a hue of green, like it's a defect on the, on the greenish uh, kind of form of plants. What he does is to, he inverts the localization, right? So what counts as an atom is, a, is the weird reflections of light. And the, let's say the regular color of, of the landscape is actually localized by the atom, by this other atom. But can you say that it wasn't there? Of course it was there. And, and there is a beautiful clip of him with a palette of colors, like one of those, you know, uh, just like a bunch of sh small pieces of paper with colors, you know, and he goes into the near the plant and he just puts the pink and he says, look, this is pink. Like I'm not, it's not perception problem. It was there. You just don't know how to look. Right. So, uh, it's important just so we don't get the feel that you're adding something that was nameless in the sense that it was invisible. The point is that it was visible, but localized, right? It was the matter that was informed by a different atom. And in that world, that part of the object would, would never be the localizing principle, only the localized one. If you were to localize things based on that pink, the world would not be coherent, right? There is no law of, uh, visibility of a, of a landscape where that hue gives you the view of the totality. And what the guy invented, which is, let's say, a Hockney-esque view, if you look at a world in that way, like if you look at a lot of his paintings and suddenly you see a landscape, you get a feel for a landscape that look Hockney-esque because it's moments where very which weird shades of color, which were always there, you can kind of Re kind of inverse the whole world and look at them as the localizing principle. Like they give you the predicates that describe the world and the proper coloring of the blue in the water, the green in the leaves, the, the blue in the sky, they are the exceptions, right? So um, I think this is, um, the, uh, oh, uh, undo on, on your delete, uh, Dennis. Okay. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, uh, has undone right. everything. Yes, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, I think the, this, this is very again didactic. This uh, because um, this reminds me of um, the uh, like elementary calculus that you have derivation when you have a function and you want to get to the actual uh, actual matter of that function, which is uh, like a point of inflection. 
uh, in that function, uh, which is uh, basically the process of derivation. But then you have in elementary calculus, you have the integral, which you have as a, a surface that you want to find what function uh, actually uh, bounds this surface. Um, so it is exactly deriving the function, which is a name from a space that is already given, which is the multiple. So in that case, um, the process, the, the process of naming is like the integral operation, uh, which is from a spectral analysis, you find the actual function, which is pi, which names uh, what this spectral analysis stands for. Um, so that's why this is, um, um, this, this makes it much more clear what he means by the actual multiple to, to be invoked or a stand for uh, a new uh, transcendental, which is the new, uh, basically, uh, logic for appearing that is particular to that, mm -hmm. to that, to that object. I think this uh, quote is also important because later on it comes up that uh, he relates three things together, modification, uh, fact, and singularity. It says, um, and this is important to our discussion that um, he is basically collapsing, not collapsing, but uh, relating all this under the rubric of uh, logic, um, and avoids this chasm between historicity and, and structure uh, by uh, which he calls it the rigid uh, opposition. So just let me, let me read it. Moreover, in place of this rigid opposition between situation and event, I unfold the nuances of the transformation from mobile, immobile modification all the way to the event properly so-called by way of the neutrality of fact. And that is, uh, that is for him uh, an important step. Also, I mean, talking about facts, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I was planning to do this, but I didn't have time yet. Like I wanted to kind of try to create a, a parody of Wittgenstein's Tractatus with Badiou, because Badiou in this chapter, I mean, who would expect that in the chapter about Radical transformation. This is the chapter where he <laughs> has good things to say about Wittgenstein. <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, Which is, yeah, that is weird. It's so <laughs> weird. And I mean, it's my favorite book by Wittgenstein. It's like my top three books of philosophy ever. Uh, so I love the Tractatus. And I was wondering, like, how could Logics of Worlds be rewritten as the Tractatus? You know, I think it would look very yes. pretty. Yes, this is my best. Actually, I think, I think that all the time, every, almost every philosophy book I read, I'm thinking, how could it be like uh, rewritten as a, like a, like a Tractatus? Yeah, the, well, the, the statements, the 66 statements is already a step toward that. Yeah, exactly. You already yes, have a step yes, there. Right. It's almost there, but it, it has to, it, 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 it still lacks some structure. It's, it's not just statements. You have to have like some, I know, some kind of I know. hierarchical structure in order to arrive at like a tractatus like Maybe this form, is something like. that we can take on. Yes, I was, yeah. that's what I, was I, I was thinking of doing like, it was like a little treat. That was, um, perhaps we can still try it. But I find this very impressive. That but I have to say that I love logical investigation. Yeah, and I love it too, man. It's, it's really amazing. It's, uh, well, such, uh, such an uh, amazing uh, book. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't let, but, don't let yeah, but there's so some, I mean, there's but there is this, this, it's so, it's so like such a kind of crystal castle of perfect propositions in you know, the tractatus. Yeah. But again, I find it amazing that you get Wittgenstein uh, here because I think that's where you sh that's how you should understand this idea of immobility. I mean, again, a first reading of, of, uh, of Badiou. And I think that this, this is the point where the formalism is, absolutely uh, essential because if you just read the conceptual parts from object relation and then to, to the part on, on tra transformation, you get the impression that he actually means timeless worlds. And uh, I think that Wittgenstein helps conceptually to 
to see that that's not the case because anything that you can describe as a fact for Wittgenstein is immobile in a certain sense. Like it's, or any transformation you, I mean, it's funny because first I, I, re, I, I did the, 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 the search. Wittgenstein is the most quoted philosopher in the book that is not uh, either treated in a section like the, I think it's the only philosopher that he quotes in more than one book in the in the actual project that is not let's say the the title of a section like Kant, Leibniz, Hegel. So if you exclude those, the only guy that he quotes multiple times is Wittgenstein on the object section, on the transcendental section, on the relation section when he says, you know, re, all the tra properties are of objects, not of relations, and then again here. So. It's it's quite weird, right? Uh, it's quite uh, yeah, it's quite striking. And, not, and there is nothing on this. And it shows his admiration for the ontological side of Wittgenstein. That is in the in the book about Wittgenstein. Yeah, he likes the Tractatus for its ontology. So it's the idea of objects. These objects enter into states of affairs. They enter into states of affairs because they have a even if they are atomic and simple, they have form, which is something re really weird in Wittgenstein. They have a certain form, even if they are atomic, they are simple. This, this form cannot be predicated. You cannot predicate what the form is, logical form. You only know that they have a logical form by the states of affairs they enter into. Mm -hmm. And when they enter into states of affairs, you describe them with propositions. So the very fact that they enter into certain relations within prepositions is what is showing their form instead of saying what their form are. What transcendental form logic. Yeah, it's a transcendental. The so logics of worlds could be called the logic of state of affairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's quite tractarian. But the, tract the tractatus uh, is, yeah, in a sense, it's immobile. Like, I don't, don't remember who was the commentator. They said it's like... A, the states of affair, the, the world of the Tractatus is like a succession, succession of photographs. It's not like a film. Like you take a picture and then another, choof, 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 several instantaneous pictures like this. And you have different, different states of affairs. Things are changing, but you only picture them statically. Mm -hmm. Which is actually how that movies that. work. So people should, yeah. should say, yeah. fuck you to that. <laughs> No, I understand, of course, but you know, <laughs> just joking, uh, joking. <laughs> it's not a Deleuzian world. You know yeah, what I mean? It's not a Deleuzian world, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like those, um, I don't know whether you it's guys... It's not a Bergsonian world. world, either, like it, this kind uh, of world, right? In these uh, notebooks that you you uh, you uh, draw, draw things and then you flip through the size of the notebook quickly and that turns into a... Uh, motion picture or uh, or cartoon or something anyway yeah um so the site um he takes i like uh, among the examples uh, between rousseau and paris commune uh, of obviously i like the example uh, of paris commune so i just made a very simple uh, uh, summary here that um the word of paris in the spring of 1870 is a divided word already as its transcendental organization assigns in intensities of political existence according to two antagonistic criteria. So the, the site was already ripe with uh, antagonism. On one side is the submissive forces of the Republican bourgeois who in the specter of the internal enemy had already capitulated to Bismarck's Prussia in the aftermath of this submission, they formed a government in Bordeaux under, under Thiers. On the other hand was the internal enemy, none other than the working class who had occupied Paris and had formed the National Guard and was in possession of several hundred cannons. So um, he actually opens the chapter with the, these two beautiful quotes, uh, sorry, beautiful uh, passages that I quoted here. Multiple, which is an object of this world, whose elements are indexed on the transcendental of the world, is a site if it happens to count itself in the referential field of its own indexing. Everything that we have been talking about, that it creates a source of indexing, the multiple itself. 
or a site is a multiple which happens to behave in the world in the same way which regard to itself as it does with regard to its elements so that it is the ontological support for its own appearance. And a site supports the possibility of a singularity because it summons its being in the appearing of its own multiple composition. It uh, makes itself in the world the being there of its own being. Among other consequences, the site endows itself with an intensity of existence. A site is a being to which it happens that it exists by itself. One thing that I just realized, it's beautiful, these two passages. Yeah. One thing I just realized with the specter of the internal enemy is that the spectral metaphor we were using from spectralism actually perfectly <laughs> applies. <laughs> Yeah. Right there, the specter of communism was a spectral analysis Marxism did of the working class and said, ah, there is some stuff that can happen here. <laughs> uh, if you just look at people. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. It's a spectral analysis and that's the cause of a specter. And uh, what I love about this is that he gives you a materialist theory of specters, like of ghosts. Yeah. Uh, specters are, let's say, how forms that are hidden in the matter appear to those who don't uh, defend that it has form. Mm -hmm. Right? So the actual form of possible communism that the working class can produce appears to the powers in Europe in the beginning of the manifesto as a specter. That's right? very beautiful, actually. And that's why it is a scary. It's like gin. I don't know whether you guys know about gin. It's uh, very popular in uh, in Oriental cultures as uh, as forms that um, are um, evanescent, evanescent, and they come and go. And some people uh, see it and they, uh, but they cannot figure it out. But some people see it more consistently. Um, and uh, they can relate to those to those forms, and it's a source of uh, great fear. And uh, it's it's very it's very interesting. Yeah, um, I think that there is a nice. Uh, I mean, uh, in a sort of very cheap anthropology, you know, of ghosts and specters. It, the people say that the first sort of idea of a specter comes from an equation like this, right? The living, the dead are the supposedly formless, but the form of the dead appears, right? So it, what was supposed to return to pure formlessness, which is how the nomadic people left their dead, like they just rot. Once you live in the place where the dead are buried, right? The form of the dead remains after life. So you get the, that sort of Stuff that is supposed to be decomposing back into nature, it remains with too much form, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, but something unexpected happened on March 18 that resulted uh, to an event we know of the Paris Commune lasted from March 18 to May 28. A coup was conducted to take back the cannons from the National Guard by some uh, detachment of Thiers Gov army uh, from uh, 3 a.m. to 11 a.m. It seemed that all was successful. But at 11 a.m., something happened by its own accord. People led by women encircled the Thiers soldiers and took back the cannons. The government that had placed itself within Hotel de Ville uh, fled and hid inside Versailles. Paris belongs to the ins insurrections. So the essence of what had happened, uh, what uh, taken place on March 18 is the appearance of an unknown capacity and an unprecedented power. Again, such a, such a continuity with what we have been discussing. From the perspective of the rule-based appearing, the possibility of a proletarian government does not exist, not even for the militant workers, but the circumstances force such a possibility to appear. But you say that March 18 is the site because it imposes itself on all the elements that contribute to its own existence as invoking by force on the indistinct background of worker being an, an entirely new transcendental evaluation of the latter's intensity. 
March 18 appears as an object in the Paris world of spring 1871 by distorting and subverting the rules of appearing in that world by means of the support being March 18. Uh, and I like this quote that says, willy-nilly, they constitute themselves into political authority. <laughs> the willy-nilly is really good. Yeah, willy-nilly was really good. But what I, also what I like about this is that, uh, as, you, as you summarize here very nicely, that uh, the site, again, it's not enough. I mean, for example, if you do the spectral analysis of the timbre of a certain instrument, that is not the same as the appearance of a new capacity, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if you're a scientist doing it and a Fourier analysis of the spectrograph, I mean, there's no new capacity. On the contrary, it's the proof of the capacity of science. Like you already knew Fourier analysis can do that, right? As a musician, when you do that, what emerges, you recognize in that dynamical uh, range that emerges from your analysis, something you know of. Like, like this is a musical, musical capacity. Dynamic, yeah. Right? Yeah, you recognize in a, in a temporal envelope the possibility of a formal envelope. For a whole exactly. Generation. If you weren't engaged with musical forms or only with science, you would say, look how Fourier was a fucking genius. But when you <laughs> are engaged with musical experimentation, Music, yeah. like, and you have a problematic in mind, like how else can I extract, which I think is very much the problem that they had, right? from concrete music and the whole yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, chef affair and things like this. You want, you want concrete forms to beget the logic of your musical space. And if you have that in mind, when you do the spectral analysis, there is a chance you'll say there is a capacity here. And what I find important in the formulation is that uh, it's weird that you cannot talk about this capacity in the first person, right? That's the, that's the strange, let's say, qualitative dimension of the subject for Badiou, right? The capacity emerges, but you cannot assume it in the first person, like, oh, look what I can do. No, it's look what this thing is doing, right? In musical, in art, this will usually be connected with a sort of object or material analysis of some, some material. In politics, is the material is the association of people. So it would make no sense to say, look what I'm capable of doing, right? And that's why the statement is uh, uh, appearance of an unknown capacity, right? That wasn't said to exist even for the militant workers. Uh, and also I really yeah, suggest- I copied, there's a a part of the, I copied a part of the tractatus in the chat and it's quite striking in fact. Look at this, in logic, nothing is accidental. If a thing can occur in an atomic fact, the possibility of that atomic fact must already be prejudged in the thing. <laughs> Man, I mean, we didn't, we didn't talk about this, but why did Badiou choose the name atomic logic? I think it's probably Wittgenstein. Like, where, is it, where else is that? It must be prejudged, prejudged in the thing. The thing, the thing itself, lends itself to it to the to the connection mm -hmm. this, is, this is quite striking you're right the connection i think it is would very so to speak, actually yeah, it's, it, it would so to speak to appear as an the... accident and to a thing that could exist alone on its own account subsequently a state of affairs could make could be made to fit he's criticizing this idea if things can occur in atomic facts this possibility must already lie in them a logical entity cannot be merely possible. Logic treats of every possibility and all possibilities are its facts. Just as we cannot think of spatial objects at all apart from space or temporal objects apart from time, so we cannot think of any object apart from the possibility of its connection with other things. So well, this, space is a, this is still modification. Object. Yeah, this is modification. Yeah. This is still modification. Yeah. yeah, and I think but, for, for Wittgenstein, he would agree. He would just say that it's impossible. Uh, he would, I think the, the difference would have emerged in the Tractatus in the idea that there is a logic of showing and not only a logic yeah. of saying, right? For, for Wittgenstein, the logic of showing can never be said, right? So the logic of the mystical can never be, is not a logic, which I think it's a problem yeah, of, is, of the logicist world. 
like yeah it's 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 still in the logicist logicist program in a sense it's not it's not really a logicist work but it's connected to the logicist pro program in a sense and it, uh, it is also what makes it a work of anti philosophy in a sense as well yeah because it if you work Sorry, yeah. It feels right. to me like uh, it should take an interlude, like a mathematical interlude, and make it Tractatus interlude. That would be cool. I, I, I'd be down for that. Yeah. I, could, I could do that. <laughs> I mean, not, not satisfied with unifying Hegel and Spinoza, the guy's not going to unify the investigations and the tractate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is quite, That's this true. Is, this is, this is quite important, yes. So but I think, I mean, I, I think we should explore the hypothesis that atomic logic was chosen, like, because of Wittgenstein. I don't know, I mean, sure, Lucretius, and he says he's like an heir to Lucretius or whatever, but where else does the expression atomic logic come from? Well, I, I know it's in the Principia. Uh, quite yeah, prevalent is, in, is Russell, in Leibniz as well. Wittgenstein, Leibniz talks Russell. about atoms, atomic logic. Well, he does not talk about atoms, but uh, his basically monadology is atomic logic. No, I agree. I mean, I mean, just expression itself, you know, like, I think yeah, it's Russell and Wittgenstein. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's Russell and Wittgenstein. Atom, atom, logical atomism is, is Russell and Wittgenstein. So, I mean, not even Frege. Not, not even Frege. So, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Willy-nilly. Okay. <laughs> Willy-nilly. We are coming up with the uh, some connections willy-nilly. Um, so ontology of the site, um, uh, from an ontological standpoint, a site is a multiple that is an element of itself. So here you go. Um, but here I'm, I'm uh, probably at the time, now our, um, uh, our didactic method I think is, is very clear and very, um, uh, much better than what uh, I think naming is. But here I'm saying, but you want to distance the discussion of the site from discussion of naming as we saw before. But to me, still the discussion of naming in order to understand the self belonging is illuminative, especially the similarity of the event, uh, event naming with proper names. The proper name uh, is a signifier. And that is, I think what Jacqueline Miller says, but uh, the proper name is a signifier that falls within what it signifies. It becomes part of the signifier. Similarly, an event that receives a proper name like Paris in the spring of 1871 or French level revolution is what, uh, what um, Jacques L. Miller calls uh, a sinking uh, signifier, a, sin a signifier that is sunken inside the signified itself and becomes part of the signified. The signifier event is contained to what the event itself contained. So I think that is, um, that's a good didactic uh, usage of proper name in order to understand what really self-belonging here means uh, in this case. Yeah. But I think uh, our discussion of, uh, of form on matter and uh, the whole, the, the whole interlude we had about theory of the subject is, is really good. It's much better than uh, the discussion of naming. Um, Yet naming, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not I, I think you agree on, with me on this. I'm not prepared to just jettison naming. Yeah. Uh, because it seems that it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, we, were, we were giving a class like uh, 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 earlier today about this, uh, we were, I was, I mean, one of the, my last comments was whether naming is necessary for the event. Don't, don't know if you remember, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. But I was, I'm not sure if whether, whether naming is, is necessary for the event, even though in being an event, naming is, is kind of a component of the event, of, of the truth procedure. But this is because naming, in a sense, uh, facilitates the participation and I'll, I'll not facilitates, but declares the participation within a situation that is within something that is indiscernible from the state of the situation in a sense. So this is kind of the function of naming there, right? Like, like if you give a name, like uh, we were discussing like the Schoenberg example earlier, like the guy starts doing the, all these noises, all this, this weird stuff. And then he, he comes, 
the fact that he's being imitated, that he's being copied, that he's being, people are taking his ideas uh, 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 forward and they are giving it a name in a sense. It um, uh, makes it, um, almost, it, it almost makes it a thing, but it's not quite that because of course, there's a material side to it. Of course, serialism, et atonality is something that is inscribed, prejudged, as Wittgenstein was saying, in the, in the, in the atomic objects of music. Of course, this, the possibility is inscribed there. But naming has still this, this function of declaring an existence that is indiscernible from the state of the situation. Something like that, right? Yeah, well, but I think so, it, uh, that uh, from our discussion, it became a bit clearer to me. And this was something that I, I kind of had to think about, mull over a bit because of psychoanalysis. Because psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. uh, like there is a point in Lacan that he uses the finite and the infinite as an example of what happens in analysis. Like you do many, many sessions, you go over your problems many times, it's a finite procedure, but at some point you capture something about the sequence as a whole. And you say, ah, I work like this. And Lacan calls this a name. And he says, well, what Cantor did was to name the actual infinity. And I think that's a wrong formulation because names, they don't create a new operator. They just create a name. So the name of infinity was very well known. Everyone knows the name of infinity. The issue is how to create a new operation. So to name how you function, like in analysis, ah, I, the thing that always escapes me has this name. That's like the theory does that already. Like it gives you a name for this. And many, many, many patients are happy with just reproducing that. But what's novel is if you can extract a new operation from that, mm -hmm. right? And that's the difference between a name and an axiom or a name and a hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. And I, what I find interesting that I, that I realize now is that from the outside of a revolution, revolution is a proper name because I either find it uh, absolutely ordinary, like these guys are, are just doing some social turmoil thing. They're just like rebels or whatever. Yeah, they're baderneiros, exactly. And I have a regular name for that that applies to many situations, not a singular name, right? So they're rebels. But it is like troublemakers in Portugal. Yeah, they're but troublemakers. They are troublemakers, yeah. Or I have a proper name because I don't know what it refers to. Like as if revolutionaries names nothing, like Peter. And I, it's just a primal baptism. It, 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 that's just what it is. But for revolutionaries, the word revolution didn't name like a proper name. It actually is the mark of an operator. To behave like a revolutionary is different from behaving like something else, right? Like serialism is not the name, it's not a proper name of a mu musical movement. No, no, it's a procedure. It's, it's a, a procedure, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the point where a procedure, like a form touches on language. So at that point, you're yeah, not something really... like that. Still, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. But, but there's something still about the naming that it's not really the naming that is, I agree, it's not really just the naming that is important, but the naming kind of uh, makes explicit something, more like in a Brandomian sense. It's not that it creates the phenomenon, but it makes explicit, no, we are engaged within this. It, we are giving it a yeah. name. But I think Nothing that like you, you could treat this as a more contingent thing because, for example, you can, you can find examples of eventual procedures where there is a clear, distinct name, for example, revolutionaries or something like this, and situations where the name is not clear. And let's say what counts as a name is the very confusion. We don't know what this is called or uh, something is happening, but we don't know what it is. Like... Uh, there are, I don't think you need to have such a strict theory of the role of naming so much as you have a theory of the role that names can have, right? They might function as the thing that, I mean, it's more pragmatic. Like sometimes a big, strong differential name saves a process from oblivion. Sometimes it yeah, gets stuck, like right? Yeah. But you don't need yeah. to have such a strong commitment to it because the whole point is rather how will that name kind of acquiesce or submit to the procedure, right? So for example, 
you get this, the situation where being a communist sometimes, I mean, at the same time, even, it can kind of mark that something is possible at the level of popular organization, but it can also get in the way because some people are afraid of that name. So you, yeah. you, you get, let's say, it becomes more important the fact that a certain pragmatism of making the idea effective emerges and you start treating names according to a different rule than, let's say, the names themselves, right? So I like, I think naming is, is, I mean, it's, we actually downplay this a lot, right? But you has a whole theory of language in being an event, what he calls a subject language. So it's very important. I mean, he's not dismissing that uh, a lot goes on on how you learn to speak about what's going on mm -hmm. and how that speech is connected to a, to a process. But I think that in logics of roads, since you get a, a very a much more sophisticated theory of how names behave in worlds, right, and how properties, predicates, and so on relate to the components of a world, I think you can see that the problem is not the naming itself so much as the infrastructure which names need to negotiate with, right? Uh, so sometimes some things are carried under old names. For example, uh, a lot of popular revolts in in the 1500s, uh, they were religious movements and they were reproducing religious terms, right? They called themselves what the status quo already had in terms of names, but they made that, oper that operate in a new way. For in the Haiti revolution, they called themselves uh, Republicans, French Jacobins, like Jacobins like the French, but the word Jacobin worked in a different way. Right. So sometimes I think I think you can have a more kind of nuanced theory of names. I don't think you can let them go completely, but perhaps I think you can uh, be more... uh, one one simple way between being an event uh, and uh, logic of the words to 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 say that like in in being an event, he never claims that events uh, require subjects. Events is something that. Uh, um, this, the um, eventual sites are very materialistic and part of the being itself. There are singularity in every multiplicity, so on and so forth. But the whole procedure of the event and the whole procedure of naming and fidelity has a very, very strong con subjective connotation. And mm -hmm. he's stepping away from that. Is basically creating a machinery here that would not require naming or intervention of an uh, of a subject for uh, for multiplicities to uh, to basically become eventual and to create sites of singularity, right? Whether you can draw consequences of this and these consequences basically. Uh, through theory of points and theory of body becomes something that uh, is material within the world, which requires intervention of the subject is one thing, but the actual machinery of, uh, of the evanescence and, and the temp uh, temporal appearance of, of a singularity does not require subjective intervention. So we are still in phenomen uh, objective phenomenology. That's the way I understand it. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the big point here is that, I mean, he, he, he says this many times, right? In, I would say that in, in being an event, the main subjective concept is fidelity. In logics of worlds is incorporation. And then in, in moments of truth, it's participation, like uh, because the logic is the finite and the infinite and so on. But incorporation, it helps to see the point, which is uh, how do you turn that formless matter into a form. That's how, that's the move from objects to a body, right? Uh, it's not the move from uh, formless to the formed. Like it, it's not simply a reintegration. Like, this didn't have form, now it has a form. So there is a mediation there by the concept that it hasn't introduced yet, which is the body that I think makes it more, like it spells out the difference really between the two books because uh, now you are not faithful to something. Now you incorporate yourself in some, 
So faithful to has that subjective quality, right? But incorporate to means that the thing is there. Mm -hmm. uh, despite your, uh, your intervention. Yeah, exactly. Or the material condition is there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, this is, uh, I guess I'm getting to the end of the presentation. Uh, I guess top of the hour should be. Yeah, so a, uh, a site is a reflexive multiplicity which belongs to itself. So these are the three properties. Uh, it carries out a transitory cancellation of the gap between being and being there. Because in this case, being and being there is becoming the same, uh, same multiplicity. Uh, or comes the, the comes from the same multiplicity, and number three, a site is an ontological figure of the of the instant it appears only to disappear. So these are the three properties, um, ontological properties. Then he moves on to the uh, topic of consequence. Um, he says that uh, so the entire doctrine doctrine of change cannot be reduced to site. Site is just one of the Topics as we alluded to earlier, modifications are those changes that a multiplicity must endure through the assignment of different trans, uh, transcendental intensities. In the formal chapter, he says, every multiple that has at least two elements that are not maximally identical is already going through a modification, has to go through modification because the pair, uh, that uh, is made of those two atoms uh, is a pair that makes modification to the, uh, to the object. And there are in intermediaries between transcendental modifications and the true event of sight, which we called fact, uh, we saw earlier on. In addition to the three uh, ontological properties from a logical or intraworldly perspective, the site should also be analyzed in terms of the consequences it has on the intensities of the atomic existence. In terms of transcendental logic, consequence is the relation between the transcendental degrees, a relation that Badiou had called dependence. So we re recall from the first book that we say a degree Q is dependent on degree P according to the envelope of all the, uh, I think he said a territory, um, the territory of all the elements whose conjunction with P is less than Q. So basically he says, he, he uses a better uh, terminology here. He says that this is how much the envelope is how much Q is implicated by P or is entailed by P. Um, so that is what he called dependence. So dependence is this entailment or um, being entailed. When we go to atomic logic, uh, so that is the actual transcendental, which is the Heiting algebra. When we go to actual uh, atomic logic, the um, this, these degrees are the degrees of existence of atoms. Thank you. And uh, so in this case, an atom B is entailed by atom A according to the degree of existence that atom B has, but the actual uh, algebraic formula is the same as the transcendental logic. Um, so uh, the quote here is, I think is important too. This site is the appearing disappearing of a multiple whose Paradox is self-belonging, so no, no surprise there. The logic of the site concerns the distribution of intensities around this disappeared point, which is the site. We must therefore begin by the beginning. Uh, what is the value of existence of the, the site itself? We will then proceed by dealing with what this allows us to uh, infer about consequences. So I think that this is the big change, right, from being an event as well, that right. now we have a theory of intensity connected to logical implication. So different intensities of appearance of this uh, formless matter will increase or decrease the capacity for logical implications or not, right? 
So there's implicative structure that you can, for example, in the spectral analysis, the spectralism example again, say, you can say, well, sure, I can make this analysis, but nothing follows from it. It's minimal, like, sure, it's, it's just there, right? Yeah. But you can also say, if this is true, then let's say a certain musical sequence that responds to the timbre, timbre of a certain instrument will sound in a certain way, right? That's the exploration of the concept and the implications of that, so. Mm -hmm. I think it is important, like uh, what we said earlier, again, he's making his best effort to make this objective. So it is not, again, the matter of naming, it's a matter of intensities. And it's a matter of combination of these intensities that are all related to an algebra, algebra that is embedded in the world. Yeah, exactly. So for example, so saying politically, ah, but we can all hold hands and that will be like a political piece, right? Uh, nothing follows from that. Like that doesn't touch, that, that doesn't negotiate with the actual, let's say, tendencies of people who are being informed by a certain political law. It doesn't exactly. extract from those people a new law. It just tries to impose from the outside. Right? Exactly. It's different from saying, if I consider this relation, for example, which is something that happens, I think the, the last uh, decades have shown this very well. For example, if you say that the connection between workers and their families is actually, a, has a logic, which is the patriarchal logic of the sexual division of labor, something follows from that. For example, that women are able to organize across divisions between the competition of laborers. That's extracting a law, like a logic out of the matter. Out of the matter, exactly. Uh, like extracting an intensity, actually, intensity of existence. Does such a prop, uh, does to use what uh, Dennis, Dennis said, does such a property exist? So, or what is the name of, sorry, what is the name of that property? What is the name of what they are capable of? This is a very Lazaruian way of saying it. What, what are people thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So what people are thinking today or in this is exactly that integral operation that you look at the actual capability and then you name it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this so is I, the think, I think that a good way of talking about integrals in that case would be to find, uh, let's say, is to find a, a smaller upper bound than the one that you already had, like for this integration, right? So uh, of course the world already integrates the family unit. The wage system is meant to pay for the whole family, right? So to, to find the name of that capacity is to find an integral that is, let's say, more intimate, more closely related to the multiple. Yeah, Singularly. like an envelope. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, the envelope of that multiplicity, right? Exactly. So this is coming together, man. It's very nicely coming together. Various different aspects, like uh, with Lazarou, with uh, Karatani, and uh... yeah, this guy's good. This guy's <laughs> he knows he knows what's talking about. <laughs> willy nilly, <laughs> willy nilly, some, somehow the thing. Somehow willy nilly is like calling this atomic logic and using Wittgenstein. So, um, so we just saw that the true change has these three properties, self-changing indication of the void and disappearance in an, in an instant. Ontology, however, does not prescribe the value of the existence of the site. An upsearch can have no local appearance and no trace. A site uh, may nonetheless, by virtue of its existential insignific insignificance, differ little from a simple modification. Again, these are, I, I can't emphasize this enough that uh, for me, it's very important because this was, these, you remembered, uh, Gabriel, how much difficulty I had. I think uh, you were there with me in these sections of the theory of events. Um, yeah, definitely. Being an event, and so this is this is very, um, a very positive a positive change for me because this objective aspect and providing 
an algebra for, for all this is, is uh, so nice to see. Only a complete power of existing differentiates a site from the simple network of modification in which the law of the world persists. So he's creating this term that is called fact that uh, is a site that does not exist maximally is a mere fact. So the intensity around that site or the intensity assigned to the site is, is not maximum or near maximum. Uh, though ontologically identifiable because it is a singularity, it is not within appearing logical logically singularity. So there could be something that is ontologically singular, but not logically singular. That is, I think, very nice because he's splitting this property between self-belonging. So self-belonging is not the only condition. So we said in, in being an event, we said, and this is this as if you recall uh, this um, discussion that I had on Facebook with somebody that uh, this event of sight is not the only condition for uh, the event. There is there is a condition of naming, of course. So there is a so, but this is the language of uh, being an event. Here he's saying that he's again uh, getting away from that. Yeah. from that language and he's saying that there are two conditions yes there are two conditions but there is one condition that is ontological which are those three properties it has to be self-belong it has to be evanescent uh, this and that but at the same time there could be a logical condition which has to do with the degree of intensity and if that logical condition is not there it is not a site it's so amazing is, because it also explains why People think that science is how you prove facts, right? Because science has, let's say, uh, uh, kind of a, a stake on the multiple, right? So where politics fails, meaning something is logically faulty in the political world, for example, you can have a scientific analysis and say, no, but it did happen, right? But to make the scientific analysis of facts is to say, it did happen, but nothing follows from it, right? Uh, it, but it's very interesting to see that, I mean, his whole point about, well, science tends to have a, a grasp of the multiple, right? Uh, that it plays very nicely with the very kind of commonsensical use of facts. Like, it's supposed to end the discussion, not begin something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you bring facts usually with those two things. Like, you need something which is an ontological view, no, but this is what it is. Uh, and logically, you are actually trying to close something up. Like, this ends the discussion. Like, it never, nobody does, from facts, nothing follows, right? From, mm -hmm. on the contrary, facts follow from something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it, I think it fits very nicely, this whole, whole debate today on, and I think, it, weirdly enough, but you is against uh, the enlightened intelligentsia who, mm -hmm who is worried that people are not satisfied with the facts, right? And but you would say, I think, of course, they're not satisfied with the facts. Because they are not after them. Yeah, nobody, can, like, that's not the point, right? <laughs> yeah. So this table summarizes what uh, we have in terms of change. Uh, so finally, we have modification, which fits into the framework of ontology and logic. There is, there is a continuity, uh, like, the quote that uh, JP read from Wittgenstein, that all, everything is already emb embedded. Ontologically, yeah. everything is in, embedded. Every element is account for. The state of the situation is aware of every single element within that. So it is already there. And logically, it is embedded because for every single element, there is an, uh, there is an transcendental indexing that, to that element. We have fact, which is kind of multiple that is ontologically not accounted for. So the state of the situation cannot account for that multiplicity, but the intensity attached logically in the world of appearing is very weak. So near, uh, near minimal, near mu. 
And then we have singularity that is uh, both supernumerary, uh, which ontologically means that it's, it's self-belonging and logically strong. And I think these uh, quotes uh, are redundant, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, you guys can take a look at it. This is what I have for today. Uh, one thing that just before we, we end, I think it's useful to mention, let, just, uh, j let me just get the screen a second. Uh, this is the actual page from the book. Uh, again, just to kind of hammer down the point about it, like it's, you can see that uh, that events are uh, kind of an uh, exceptional case of facts, right? So it's not only that, okay, he distinguishes events from facts and that you shouldn't confuse the two and there's a distinction, but singularities and facts are both side, inside the side, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, sure, we could say like, Facts are, are sites with no consequences, right? That's why they don't have maximal existence and singularities are facts with consequences. But there is no place for events like that is qualitatively outside of facts. It's objective. Like it's not a matter of, ah, but in my head, I feel that this is new. Like I don't care. Like if there is no material bit, I mean, I just think that this, this thing here really clarifies that uh, you know, you want more than facts, but because facts are not okay, less than facts, yes. not less than facts, exactly. Yeah. So there's the, to, fact plus fact plus exactly like this is more something and this is more something, but it's based on this. So you don't get to, to like, it totally removes the idea that events come from miracle places. Like events yeah. are facts plus consequence. Like, yeah. I mean, I think that there are two, two levels of consequence. Like, events are facts of a quality such that they can have consequences, right? But uh, it's not, oh my God, it can come from anywhere. Like, no, it, there's, there's only the stuff that's there. Like, you, can, you cannot add something from outside. Very good. Okay. Actually, um, actually, actually I never really, really, uh, this is a personal disclosure. I never really understood all this whole problem of the event within French philosophy. I, I was always like, what are with it? these French people? What's, uh, I'm, I'm half French, but I can, I can say it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, what of it? Why, why what's the problem with, with the event? No, no, we are doing this philosophy. We are, we are, uh, we are bashing Hegel because we, we want to think the event, like destroy Hegel, reject Hegel in order to open the way, to pave the way to the philosophy of the event. Or, or the same with structuralism. No, we have to, to reject structuralism because we but want to event is the event. Even in phenomenology, Heideggerian and existentialism so and, what's, and all that. What's the, what's the problem with thinking the event? This never struck me as, struck me as, as really problematic to, to think what's, what's an event, really. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's a really good book by Francois Doss called uh, Philosophy of the Event. I think he just gives a sociological analysis of how that kind of stuck. But I think that, uh, I mean- Can you put that name somewhere? Francois Doss, D-O-S-S-E, right? I think it's like this. But I'm not sure if it's written like that. But- uh, I think it's like that, Doss. Dos. I know, Ed, I think the last name is correct. I'm not sure if it's Francois, the first name, but- I think I, it is. It is, right? Dos. But I don't know, I think that uh, the whole, I mean, this is a big problem for 20th century philosophy in general, right? You want to be able to think yeah. about law, tendency, regularity, but you want to be able to think about subjectivity, contingency, freedom. And I think that events were the name that French philosophy found for uh, structural change, like structural, structural novelty. So they don't, you don't want to give way, don't want to return to pre-structuralist age. But you want a term for what it, what was not included in structural oh, the book is in French, right? Yeah, it's a very French thing. Like, uh, and I think that I mean it was. I think it fits two two conditions. One is 
we don't want to be structuralists. And second, we cannot accept the name that Marxists already have for this, which is his history. So you want a non-teleological history. And like what a non-Hegelian as well. The same. Yeah. They, they are rejecting Hegel because Hegel was so big at the time. So you, you had like Hegel on one side and structuralism on the other. And, yeah. and then you get like all these people like Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault, everybody thinking the event. Yeah. But I think that, I mean, it was very much in the spirit of <coughs> What's the name of the, of the book? Uh, oh my God, man. I think it's Philosophies of the Events. Something like this. Oh. I'll, I'll look for. I'll look for. Look it up and send it to you guys. Uh, yeah, because he has a couple of books on history of structuralism. Yeah, uh, uh, he studied the two things. I know that the. Uh, his, yeah. I know that he he. He published this in Portuguese, but I'm not sure if it's already. Yeah, it's called in French "Le Retour de l'Événement," the return of the event, uh -huh. from 2010. But I'm not sure if it's translated to English. Uh, like the it. afterlife of the event might be. Uh -huh. I'm not I sure if that's it. it. No, that's not it. Sorry, but uh, Lincoln, but uh, yeah. if you guys find it, let me. But I, I think that this is. I mean, this is very historically grounded, also, right? I mean, the experience of the '60s in Europe with all this yeah. stuff happening that wasn't supposed to. How do you give legitimacy to something that? You know, it's not historically or structurally grounded. I think that the event was the term that well, they I, not Not being familiar with French philosophy, I, I like to think that use a uh, problem with event is the problem of new. I mean, that yeah. you once, I mean, I don't know uh, much about uh, history of philosophy and, and this is new to me. I mean, I know that everybody in French philosophy is, is obsessed with the, the question of events, but uh, I don't know them, but it makes total sense for me the way that Badiou is theorizing it because Badiou is Badiou's ultimate um, ultimate philosophical goal is to provide uh, provide a grounding a, a theory to say how new thing is possible yeah what's funny is that the guy who is an exception to this event thing is Lacan Lacan doesn't use events uh, he doesn't care, and he has one co concept which is the law of encounter, which is relevant, but it's very peripheral, not like very strong. And it's funny well, because from cool. all the theorists of the event, that's the one that Badiou likes, right? The one that doesn't use the term event. Yeah, actually, that's a good point because I think my thought from this definition that we just talked about here is that if you have a good notion of consequence, you don't need the event anymore. Yeah, yeah. this is this is. Good. This is why I was making my personal disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I think I think the, 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 the idea of consequences kind of exhaust the idea of the event. So the exactly. problem if, if, if you if you get to if you get to theorize the events directly, it's very easy to like get this metaphysically inflated notion of some miracle coming down from, from the heavens or something like that. So I was always very very, how to speak, how to say, very skeptic about this this kind of this kind of uh, way of putting it. Right? Yeah, I, I think psychoanalysis is a great model because I think in psychoanalysis you construct the invent through the working through of the mm -hmm. clinic. It's not that the event comes first and then oh that's why you went to the clinic, right? It's you went to yeah. the clinic to build the event. Yeah, I agree, but I think that I mean I. Though I think it's very, very contextually charged, though you, I mean, if, I don't think that if event was a recurring term in French philosophy that Badiou would have used it, uh, and perhaps it would have been better in the long run. Uh, and it's clear that I, I mean, if you look at logics of worlds and especially immanence of truth, like there is nothing on the event, like absolutely nothing. And I would even say that, I mean, I hope at some point we get to talk about this in in immanence of truths, because you have a theory of inconsistent multiplicity, like you actually have a theory of it. Large cardinal theory is, let's say, a science of inconsistent multiplicity, multiplicities that cannot be treated as sets. Even the, the sort of underground of ontology, like that the void below consistent multiplicities, that, that's, that loses its miracle as well. Like, 
sure, it, it's inexhaustible perhaps, but there is a, there is a, a formal treatment of that as well, right? So uh, it, all kind of, all places where something substantial could be hidden and give the event a miraculous quality, it are slowly emptied out. And I agree that logical consequence here, this enriched idea of logical consequence, which I, I think we could call it intensive consequence, right? Uh, consequence intensive. that is uh, in, intensive in the sense that it's conditioned on the, on the ex, inten, intensity of existence, right? Exactly. Uh, it's an in, sort of intensive implication. Uh, it pretty much exhausts the, the content of the idea of event, but I think rhetorically, the guy would need some some term for the new, like novelty. No, new. no it makes sense. It made uh, tactically. It made, made, made yeah. I think sense. it's more tactical. Yeah, but definitely the content is slowly. He comes up with theory of the subject, 1982 and 1988 uh, being an event. He's in the in the in the context of French philosophy, still trying to to build a name from his for himself. So it's, 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 it's completely understandable to use this, this kind of uh, vocabulary. It's just yeah, but it's some... not the no that's not where the novelty is at all. Like that's, if you want, I mean, the generic, that's where like the resources for, to think something new in a new way are like, it's not the word event that really captures, you know, what's singular about it. Like, yeah, but, but it's, 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 got, it's, it's, it's got this nice title, like yeah. being an event. Yeah. yeah, he definitely wanted to say like, I'm no, kidding. but you doesn't want to be, become famous. Come on. <laughs> doesn't want to make a name for himself. No. No, that's not no so. way. <laughs> he does not use any ta every tactic in the book in order to make a name for himself. Every tactic. It's, impre it's incredible. <laughs> but then again, I, I mean, uh, I, I, it, it, yeah, the guy is a, it's the best propaganda, like, prop propaganda guy for his own project, right? He's obsessed with kind of furthering it. And uh, it, it is really, I mean, it, it sometimes I think bites him in the ass because people will say like, this is, you're, you're the one who is making it look like it's consistent because ultimately it's just like more French philosophy. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I mean. Fortunately, the, there is so material under this, um, this um, self-promoting uh, facade that we can, we can sink our teeth yeah. to. It's more, you know, than, more than enough. Yeah, I, I was talking yesterday to Dennis about this movie that I really like. And I think it's about Badiou now that I think of it. There's a movie by Bergman called The Magician. Mm -hmm. And it's about a, a, a magician who can actually do magic, real magic. But it's very small and subtle. So he actually plays fake tricks on top of the real magic so that people will believe the real magic. But then they say, but I can see through the trick, so there's nothing there. So it... It's like <laughs> another person who did this was this mystic called Madame Blavatsky. Blavatsky was a Christian mystic in the beginning of the century. And she did kind of magic charlatan tricks to give like body to the things she believed in. Mm -hmm. And people would discover the tricks and call her a charlatan because they were like fake. Uh, but then they dismissed both things like the mystical uh, approach and the, the fake tricks. And I think Badiou falls into that like, it's such an effort to, to display that something is happening that when you see through the, the rhetoric, you think you see through the whole theory, you know? So you lose both ultimately. Uh, so I think that, 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 that's, that for me, that's one of his big faults. Like he doesn't trust it enough to, and perhaps it's right. Perhaps these things, I mean, his theory is all about novelty doesn't kind of subsist by itself. So, he is consistent in thinking that if you don't promote it, it won't last. But he sometimes overdo it to the point that people will say that's only what it is, just the promotion, I think. Well, the thing is, um, a friend of mine published a book by the name uh, Spectre of Madness or something. Uh, his name is Ali Reza Tahiri. Um, and he's... Uh, he attacked Badiou. He said, I haven't read the book. It's coming out uh, sometime, like in September. Uh, it's about Hegel and Zizek, and then he attacks. And I talked to him that, uh, how much do you know about Badiou that you are attacking Badiou? Um, you think that you are attacking Badiou? He says, um, 
I have to confess that I haven't read any of his major works, but his preferral works really suck. Uh, like for example, uh, uh, death to, to death to death or something like that. He keeps saying like he had I, I had an interview about death, mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't read it, but he said that it's it's really bad. He really despises um, that little book about in praise of love. Um, so talking about the magician and uh, uh, the movie magician, I mean, it sounds like what you mean um, uh, is those are like cheap tricks that he has done. Yeah. Cheap, uh, which actually uh, has an has audience. Those cheap tricks are the are the are the stuff. Hello. That has audience, unfortunately. Love. People don't read love, theory of the subject. Seller. Huh? I believe In Praise of Love was a bestseller in France. Yeah. yeah. But that's a cheap book, right? That's it's a very cheap book. Yeah, it's yeah but I think, I mean, I, mean I, I think that that's, I, I'm not saying this to dismiss the strategy, but just to show how hard it is, because uh, this happened to Socrates and to all, everyone, like, Hegel is said to be a reactionary because he negotiated with the Prussian regime and he measured his words. Perhaps a more, he was in a conservative time. He wrote about, you know, the spirit of the French Revolution in statist terms. Now, but you has a good point on this in, in Minutes of Truths about this sort of finitism that philosophy is obliged to, to accept because you need to cover up infinity with the terms of the situation. So you might defend infinity on one side and on the other you need to kind of give it the name that exists like God in Descartes or state in Hegel. And I think that uh, it's this is, this is real like the, the beautiful soul position of oh, I only have perfect books and uh, that's my work and it will live on on its own. It's not a materialistic position because why will it live on? Like, why not? So uh, I think that he errs on the side of caution into overdoing it. Uh, and in sometimes there are easy battles. I mean, sometimes he wins very easily, like with a hand behind his back. Like, you know, there is whole discourse on love as a cynical thing. It's just an illusion. It only takes like 50 pages of a kind of ordinary work that just defends something that people don't have, like, are too anxious to defend, to become a bestseller. So it does some good as well. But uh, oh, yeah, I, think, I, think, I think I think I defend in praise of love in a sense. I think it's an interesting intervention in the public discussion about love. I know I agree, but I do think that it he overdoes it. Has it. Its role. But I think that uh, what what I just wanted to say from the discussion is that something we were talking about earlier as well. Like, I don't think it's it's contingent like but you really write not for academia and and that's not very common like he it's weird it's not doesn't make it easier it doesn't mean it's an easy book to read but he i think that he prefers to overdo it and have a stake on the vulgar uh scene of books and people and i mean he doesn't depend on if he was expelled from university nothing would change now Right? I mean, and it's funny because it's like Zizek, like everyone who claims the guy's a charlatan is an academic. And the funny thing is that all of them will go away and they can hate Zizek and the guy's one of the most popular red guys in the world. Like these are people I think who find that they need to, they need a strategy that is more solid than the one that gets the peer review acceptance. Right? And the end of the day, they are the guys who, I mean, they can live off of this stuff. So uh, I find it there is a there is a problem in the way that like the vulgarization that they themselves produce of their work covers up the cool stuff and make them look bad. But it's also very smart because their partner, like their readership, is not the academic readership. Like, of course, it is in a certain sense, but it's crazy because just imagine this, like. There, a book of refutation can come out or a, bu a book of saying that they are not rigorous or a book saying that they are 
uh, expelled, they're no longer teachers or something like this, or they could never be in teachers in a certain sense, and that wouldn't really change something. So uh, I think that having that very strong commitment to being grounded on something other than academic readership, or even if it is grounded in the academic readership, not addressing the reader as an academic, I think that that is actually a very smart strategy. Uh, not only smart, but I think it's a it's the right strategy. Like uh, it's the right strategy because academia is not standing for uh, thinking right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's something. No offense to you is, too, but yeah, yeah, oh, and, and, and it's something that is uh, now. There's a whole conversation about this, but. Uh, there's a whole area now that, you know, of readership, of philosophy that is not academic. Like, you, you can see it from, you know, the urbanomic scene, the scene around the urbanomic, Rezane Garistani, all of these. These are not really academic books. Like, Intelligence and Spirit is not an academic book. Like, it's a book with a certain technicity, but, you know, it's, it's written in a certain way in order to attract uh, certain interests that are not, you know, maybe... I think maybe an academic will read it and, 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 and think it is bullshit, right, in a sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not, I think it's a kind of, it's, it's, what I'm getting at, it's like a, a, a strategy that is, is spreading, in a sense. Maybe, you know, yeah. Reza won't do a In Praise of Love, Reza Negarestani, that is, not, not you, Reza, a mm -hmm. book like In Praise of Love, but he will do a novel. For instance, he did Cyclonopedia. He will do. He, he's writing a novel, like a thriller now, and he and he, he's he's a, he, he's also trying to trying to make a living as a philosopher. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the situation is changing in a sense for for these kinds of you know he's careers. A talented guy. Yeah, I like him very much. He's a, he's a close friend, good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm I'm partial to him. So. Okay. You 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 ought to get you ought to have, you you can you can have your criticism but you know I, I am partial to the guy because he's a are he's we friend. are we internal enemies or external enemies? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully external enemies. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Okay guys, I gotta go. Great, me too. So, yeah. Great uh, great next... great meeting. Yeah, great meeting guys. Uh, okay, so see you next week, week. Tuesday. Great. Uh, we continued the saga. Great. See you All guys. Right. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.